Bluegrass music is booming. More and more people are finding the genre and getting interested. Google Trends shows that the downward spiral is finally slowing. Billy Strings is playing larger and larger venues every year. Molly Tuttle and Billy Strings both have secured spots performing on late night mainstream TV, not to mention Billy's performance on the Grammys. Of course, my business is evidence of this too. We have more people than I'd like to admit on our waiting list for private mandolin and guitar lessons. Our February workshop that we had with Andy Hatfield, it's sold out. Well, I mean, I guess there's still some seats available for the March workshop with Mickey Abraham. Check it out at LessonsWithMarcel.com. Not to mention that other bluegrass creators like Jim Pankey have secured serious followings here on YouTube. This is new. The bluegrass scene didn't feel like this even five years ago. With that has come a lot of new fans and pickers into the scene, and I've heard from some of those people, and it sounds like you're interested in a little bit of the history and some of the subgenres of bluegrass. Maybe you're confused when people throw around terms like dog music or mash or new grass. Well, let's fix that. Here's an, albeit abridged, survival guide to the subgenres of bluegrass and some must listen to artists and albums. Be aware that subgenres don't just die and that's not what the graphics you're about to see represent. Instead, I'm merely trying to point out the heydays of these styles, so don't get angry at me. Anyway, to get started, we have to talk about the Monroe family. Brothers Bill, Charlie, and Birch Monroe had gained some popularity playing for radio stations in the Midwest and South during the 1930s. But after a disagreement over a sponsorship deal, Birch left the group, leaving only Bill and Charlie. The two would continue on, performing under the names of Monroe Brothers in the popular brother duet format of early radio. But in 1938, Charlie and Bill would split and both start their own bands. Bill Monroe would create his new band, the Bluegrass Boys, and join the Grand Ole Opry just one year later. For this evening on the Grand Ole Opry, Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys. And in 1943, Bill Monroe would introduce banjo to the Bluegrass Boys by hiring String Bean. This event led Earl Scruggs to audition for the Bluegrass Boys in 1945. This lineup includes Lester Flat on guitar, Earl Scruggs on banjo, Howard Watts, aka Cedric Rainwater on bass, Chubby Wise on fiddle, and on mandolin, Bill Monroe himself. <laughs> This band would signify the birth of bluegrass as a genre and the introduction of our first subgenre, traditional bluegrass. Traditional bluegrass is a play style, refers to the bluegrass performed in the same manner as the first and second generations of bluegrass musicians before the peak of the folk revival in the 1960s. People still play bluegrass like this, it jams across the world. Early bluegrass serves as a great common ground for all bluegrass musicians. This is territory that we have all studied, so when making music in a social setting, it makes sense to draw from the standard repertoire of traditional bluegrass. That being said, the popularity of this style and the genre at large peaked through the mid 40s to late 50s. I mentioned earlier that early bluegrass can be split into two generations. A clear dividing line for these two generations is the introduction of rock and roll to popular music. The 1950s created lean times for some bluegrass musicians. Others would add an edge to their music to compete in the changing musical landscape. Now there are a few must-know bluegrass artists from the early years, and I can't get to all of them, but let me quickly tell you about a few. First, there's Bill Monroe, who you now know is the founder of bluegrass music, and his Bluegrass Boys, the group that the genre is literally named after. Notice it appears as one word when referring to the genre of bluegrass, and two words when referring to the Bluegrass Boys, the band. That's a rookie mistake, don't want to mess that one up on the test. There's a compilation record called The Essential Bill Monroe that you can't go wrong with. Bill Monroe wrote much of the standard bluegrass song books of songs like I'm Going Back to Old Kentucky and Blue Moon of Kentucky are required listening. Formed in the same year as Bill Monroe's pivotal bluegrass band is the duo of Jim and Jesse McReynolds. They're notable for being the longest running brother duet, performing for 55 years at the time of Jim McReynolds passing in 2002, and for Jesse McReynolds' mandolin playing. Rather than playing Monroe style, he instead developed an influential cross-picking style. I recommend Y'all Come, The Essential Jim and Jesse is a great way to get started. Listen to She Left Me Standing on the Mountain and Old Slew foot once for me. The Stanley Brothers formed in 1946 and are frequently called the first band to copy the Bill Monroe sound, but they would disagree. For a long time they rejected the label of bluegrass and instead referred to their music as mountain music. They performed with their band until 1966 when Carter Stanley passed and Ralph would go on performing until his own passing in 2016. If you've seen Oh Brother Where Art Thou, you already know Ralph's voice. Give a listen to Clinch Mountain Bluegrass Live at the Newport Folk Festival. I like that album. As I mentioned earlier, Flat and Scruggs were both members of Bill Monroe's band that struck off on their own. They are, without a doubt, one of, if not 
not the most popular bluegrass acts of all time, making appearances in all kinds of media and hosting their own TV show. Check out the essential Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs. Give a listen to Get In Line Brother and Sleep With One Eye Open. If you like what you've heard so far, then you should also give a listen to Reno and Smiley, the Osborne Brothers, and Jimmy Martin and the Sunny Mountain Boys. Almost everyone in this list played with Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys at one time or another. Bill Monroe started tons of careers, but he would feel his dominance in the Bluegrass scene slip a little as we enter the Folk revival technically begins earlier in the 1900s, but it peaks in the 60s. Imagine folk artists like Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie. These artists exerted a lot of effort to expose their fans to other traditional genres like Bluegrass. Enterprising first-generation acts like Flat and Scruggs would take advantage of this newfound audience by touring colleges. With a welcoming new fan base and the new multi-day bluegrass festival format, thanks Carlton Haney, bluegrass musicians who embraced change were more likely to thrive. And one of the changes that became very prevalent in 60s bluegrass was the bluegrass cover. That could be the Dillards covering the Beatles, the Country Gentlemen singing Fox on the Run, or the Bluegrass Alliance singing One Tin Soldier. And just kidding, that last example is from 1971. I'm trying to make sure that you're paying attention, but keep Bluegrass Alliance in the back of your mind. They're gonna come back again later. It's not that a cover with a genre swap to bluegrass never happened before, but now it's happening all the time. We're also seeing multiple bands that aren't from the South gain notoriety. If you're interested in this sound, I would check out the Kentucky Colonels, formed in 1954 in Burbank, California, far from the sunny South. They released two albums in the 1960s that you should listen to, The New Sound of Bluegrass America and Appalachian Swing. The Kentucky Colonels featured Clarence White on guitar. His playing would greatly influence all future generations of bluegrass musicians. Sadly, Clarence would be struck by a drunk driver when loading gear after a show, and the Kentucky Colonels were no more. The Country Gentlemen are some of the most 60s sounding bluegrass to me. I don't know what it is about it, but give a listen to the early Rebel recordings 1962 to 1971. You likely know the Dillards from the Andy Griffith Show as the Darlings. That might win the award for most overshared bluegrass fun fact of all time, but they also wrote multiple songs that would become bluegrass standards like Old Home Place and Dooley. Doc Watson was a perfect fit for the folk scene of the 60s. He managed to win over many different groups. He was loved by bluegrass musicians, though not strictly a bluegrass musician himself. Listen to all the Doc Watson you can. I don't need to tell you a specific album, just go listen to it. Oh, and if you were wondering what the first generation guys are up to during the 1960s, let's check in on Earl Scruggs. Oh no, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, things got weird. I just try not to think about the outfits too much. Looking forward, reverence for the traditional way is still going strong in much of the bluegrass scene. Many important records in the bluegrass space were released in the 70s. If I had to pick two records that were, I guess, a little more traditional and very important, I would recommend Double Odd 44 and the Will the Circle album. Oh, but wait, what's this? It's 1970 and the folk revival band The Bluegrass Alliance has started using a new term to describe their music. Oh, and they've released an album bearing that new term called New Grass. Wait, it's 1971, and members of the Bluegrass Alliance have left to form a new band called New Grass Revival, helmed by Sam Bush. It seems like we can continue to innovate within the confines of bluegrass. New Grass continues the tradition of pulling new songs into bluegrass. Curtis Birch of New Grass Revival says, Our reason for doing the newer type music wasn't pretentious or irreverent or sarcastic or disrespectful. We just felt like people were ready to see that you could really expand the sound using those same instruments. And expand the sound they did. Instead of relying on standard bluegrass cut time grooves, they would start incorporating other feels. Sam Bush's highly influential mandolin chop played a massive role in incorporating rock and world music feels into new grass. One difficulty with the term new grass is its broad use, so I've divided the new grass movement into two waves divided by the changing lineup of new grass revival. Let me explain. The first new grass revival lineup is Curtis Birch on guitar and dobro, Courtney Johnson on banjo, Ebo Walker on bass, and Sam Bush on mandolin. This lineup gives us pop, rock, and folk-infused bluegrass. In my mind, their peers would be The Seldom Scene and John Hartford's Aeroplane Band. Much like the first, the second wave of new grass is spearheaded by the second lineup of new grass revival. That's Sam Bush on mandolin, John Cowan on bass, Bela Fleck on banjo, and Pat Flynn on guitar. This new lineup begins including world music sounds in their music, Irish influence, odd time signatures, and a focus on instrumental virtuosity. They even begin charting on pop country radio. This wave of new grass leads us to supergroups like the Bela Fleck drive band, strength in numbers, and eventually the Fleck tones. And much like the first and second generations of early bluegrass, the second wave of new grass is very intertwined with itself. Many of the the same names appear across multiple groups. And 
Unfortunately, much like the start of Newgrass being marked by the formation of Newgrass Revival in 1971, I think the close of the Newgrass era can be marked with the breakup of the band in 1989. If you have an interest in Newgrass music, I highly recommend the second wave Newgrass Revival songs Do What You Gotta Do, In the Middle of the Night, and Colin Baton Rouge. Meanwhile, David Grisman is putting together a super group of his own. It's 1975, and he's formed the David Grisman Quintet, creating new acoustic music, or as the dog himself would call it, dog music. Their self-titled album was released two years later, and it is a wild mix of bluegrass, 1930s gypsy jazz, and other things. It features the virtuosity of Tony Rice on guitar and Daryl Anger on fiddle, names that will come up again in just a second, so hold on to them. And actually, on the subject of Tony Rice, you may notice that this means that Tony Rice put out one of the most influential bluegrass records of all time, and then traveled across the country to join David Grisman for one of the most influential new acoustic records of all time. Wow. If you've never heard this record before, I highly recommend Ricochet for whatever reason. It is one of my favorite dog tunes. I particularly enjoyed the version from DGQ20. It's a retrospective album with some wonderful live recordings on it. Many past members of the David Grisman Quintet would go on to form their own groups in the same style. Much like Bill Monroe did for early bluegrass and Sam Bush did for newgrass, David Grisman provided a proving ground for his new subgenre. Tony Rice would form the Tony Rice unit and coin the term Spacegrass for albums like Acoustics, Marvel, West, Still Inside, and Backwaters. Mark O'Connor would record Markology and On the Rampage, which have strong new acoustic elements, and virtually everything Daryl Anger and Mike Marshall went on to record together has dog's fingerprints on it. I recommend Fiddlistics in particular. It might be time to go check in with traditional bluegrass. I wonder what those guys have been up to. Wow. Uh, things are happening. <laughs> Tony Rice just formed a new supergroup, and it's called the Bluegrass Album Band. Wait, what? That's a weird band name? Uh-oh. This is another subgenre. In 1981, Tony Rice released a record with J.D. Crow, Dole Lawson, Bobby Hicks, and Todd Phillips. It was slated to be a Tony Rice record, but Tony thought that it felt more like a band than a solo record, so everyone got equal billing on the cover, and the album was simply titled The Bluegrass Album. It blew up. They were asked to tour in promotion of the album, but they had no band name, so everyone called them the Bluegrass Album Band. This event serves as the genesis of neo-traditionalism, a style that uses the repertoire of traditional bluegrass but pours a little gasoline on it. A more casual term for this sound is mash, a word that means capo fourth fret and let the banjo kick things off at 160 BPMs. The role of the guitar also changes in a neo-traditional setting. Early bluegrass recordings didn't feature lead guitar. Tony Rice was even reluctant to play anachronistic guitar solos on the album, but was talked into it by his bandmates. So now the guitar solo is even more widely accepted in traditional bluegrass. I would say the peers of the bluegrass album band are acts like the Johnson Mountain Boys, Dole Lawson and Quicksilver, and the Bluegrass 95 band. I recommend Dole Lawson's Americana Master Series, Best of the Sugar Hill Years, and anything the bluegrass album band has ever recorded. Just go listen to it. You'll love neo-traditionalism. Hey, what do you know? It's already 1993. Jerry Garcia, David Grisman, and Tony Rice are hanging out, eating pizza, and playing tunes. David Grisman is recording the jam just for fun, and what happens? The pizza guy snatches the tape on his way out. That story probably never actually happened, but it's fun. You know, sue me. The tape is leaked shortly after and gets an official release by Grisman in 2000. The secret's out, man. The world has heard the noodle fest that would be the three of them hanging out. Across the country in Colorado, something else is happening. A group of friends is forming a band called The String Cheese Incident. It's happening again. Welcome to Jamgrass territory. With Jerry Garcia leading jam band culture and also playing bluegrass with Grisman and acts like Old and In The Way, this was bound to happen. Jamgrass is everything you think it is. Larger stages, light shows, rock elements, and a focus on long instrumental solos. Describing it doesn't really do the genre justice. If you're interested, go to a show or at the very least listen to some live recordings on YouTube. You should look for acts like String Cheese Incident, Yonder Mountain String Band, Green Sky Bluegrass, and the infamous String Dusters. Also a quick shout out to Leftover Salmon for being formed in 1989 and being one of the oldest examples of this subgenre. So if new acoustic music led to jam grass by way of Jerry Garcia, what happened to new grass? Well, the 80s kids who grew up with parents that listened to bluegrass loved new grass. It was a more modern take of the genre and they couldn't get enough of the Sam Bush mandolin chop. So when they hit their 20s, they had their own spin on pop infused virtuosic bluegrass. Progressive bluegrass is clearly identifiable by the crossover appeal, heavily arranged material, and the 
virtuosic push on bluegrass instruments to do things that they weren't designed to do. And who is the herald of this new genre, you might ask? Well, a young Chris Thiele is. Chris Thiele and brother and sister Sarah and Sean Watkins formed Nickel Creek in 1989 as children, like single digits in age children. They got their big break in 2000 with their self-titled album produced by Alison Krauss. It had huge crossover appeal and pop sensibilities while maintaining these strong instrumental showcases. If you've never heard this album, listen to In the House of Tom Bombadil. It's a beautiful melody with tons of odd meter sections. Also, the Fox. It's kind of a cheesy tune, but it was a big hit for them. Go listen to it. The acts like Crooked still followed suit, adding cello to a bluegrass group and experimenting with odd grooves and non-standard orchestration. If you're interested in this style, though, I recommend the album Blind Man Walking by Cadillac Sky. Listen to Born Lonesome and how carefully composed and arranged it is. It's a masterclass. I also highly recommend the Punch Brothers. I personally enjoy their 2012 releases, the album Who's Feeling Young Now and the EP Ahoy, specifically Patchwork Girlfriend and Another New World. At the current time of writing this, I'm not sure the first and second waves of progressive bluegrass have a clear dividing line for me, but it is undeniable that something has changed. The subgenre is moving away from its crossover appeal and leaning into the sometimes obtuse arranging aspects. Sierra Hole releasing an entire album of just mandolin and bass, or the Punch Brothers reimagining of Tony Rice's Church Street Blues, seem to be indications of that shift to me. My opinions on that might change, but it's at least food for thought. At the beginning of the 2000s, another sound was brewing in bluegrass though, and it appeared to come out of nowhere. Perhaps the release of Oh Brother Where Art Thou in 2000 pierced the social zeitgeist and briefly brought folk music back to the mainstream, but that sound is alternative grass, a subgenre that unlike all others cares less about holding on to tradition so much and a little bit more about attitude and presentation. Old Crow Medicine Show's 2001 appearance at the Grand Ole Opry brought a standing ovation and encore. That's a rarity for a new act, it's unheard of really. Suddenly there is an explosion of alternative grass, but these other acts have much more in common with the punk scene. This genre is sometimes called folk punk or punk grass and so on. I'm not incredibly well versed in the sound, but it's worth mentioning. I would maybe suggest Devil Makes 3, 357 String Band, and Trampled by Turtles if that's your thing. So what about modern bluegrass? Well, this is a fusion-heavy era of bluegrass. Artists like Billy Strings are combining neo-traditionalism with jam grass. Molly Tuttle regularly turns toward traditionalism, but with a new grass flair. And Sierra Hole pushes progressive bluegrass to new heights. Things are looking good for bluegrass, so if you're interested in the genre, you should follow some of these modern acts. Dig deeper into the catalogs of all the legacy artists that I mentioned, and go to some festivals. I hope you enjoyed this quick foray into all the different corners of bluegrass. Uh, leave me a comment and let me know what you thought. Please remember that the screen was already packed with info, so I couldn't mention everyone I wanted to. So if you're mad at me that I didn't mention Hot Rise, I get it, I should have mentioned Hot Rise. Unfortunately, there was nowhere on the screen to do that. Now, if you're interested in learning more about bluegrass <laughs> guitar, remember to check out my website, lessonswithmarcel.com, and maybe sign up for uh, Mickey's workshop on Endless Lines in March. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all have a good one. I'll see you later. When that train comes tumbling down.